Hello, friends of Luxury. My name is Albert Simot. Today uh, we are going to talk about uh, luxury watches from one specific perspective, investment. I got two great experts with me, Mr. Miguel Seabra and Mr. Joao Villarino. Mr. Seabra is a journalist specializing in tennis and luxury watches expert. He is also a member of the Academy of the Fundación de Lotte Orologerie de Genève. And Mr. Villarino is one of the European best luxury watches aficionados and investment advisor. I want to thank you both for being here with me. Uh, let me start uh, with uh, an apparently simple question. Uh, what defines a luxury watch? Well, a luxury watch can be defined by a product that has intrinsic quality and that uh, goes well beyond what you normally require uh, of a watch. What you require usually from a watch is a precise timekeeping. And precise timekeeping can be provided by a quartz watch that is worth one euro or two euros. It's, it's easy to get uh, a watch for that, uh, for, for that price. So um, luxury uh, watch making has everything to do with tradition, with quality, uh, and of course, even though there are quartz uh, movements that are really good and can be uh, uh, found in in the luxury watches, I would say that luxury watch making is uh, closely tied to mechanical watch making, hand wound watches, automatic watches that uh, you know uh, extend uh, a long tradition, a century long tradition, and can be. Um, uh, I mean, uh, watches that can be uh, found also with a uh, great finishing, not just, I would say, uh, luxury watchmaking would be uh, found uh, uh, above 5,000, even though you can, the, you can find watches above 5,000 euros with, with generic uh, ETA or Celita movements, I would say above 5,000, because we, we must not forget that, you know, the, the average income of, uh, of, of people around the world is, is well below 5,000 per month, well below that. Uh, so I would say that uh, these days, having a mechanical watch more expensive or less expensive is uh, a luxury in itself. And then, of course, we have all those brands, luxury brands, uh, high hand watch making that you can find uh, watches for uh, uh, a price uh, above 1 million. But that's that's uh, another extreme. Great, fantastic. And what's uh, your point of view uh, about the health of the luxury watches industry at, at the moment uh, after the the, the period, uh, the pandemic period? Well, I think uh, it's uh, the health is better than ever. I would say that the um, the market. Uh, not only the the market, but also the pre-owned market that has grown to to be valued at uh, several billion euros, uh, is in very good health because uh, there is a high demand, especially uh, limited editions, collaborations, uh, especially some models from a few um, a few brands that are really really in high demand. So uh, that's why you can you can only find. Uh, several models from certain brands uh, at prices that exceed extremely the, the original price tag. So I, I would say that uh, um, the luxury uh, watches industry is uh, in, in very good shape, especially considering that uh, some 10 years ago or eight years ago, we were questioning the future of mechanical watch making with the advent of uh, uh, connected timepieces and smart watches. Of course, the Apple Watch is uh, for itself the best selling watch in the world, but that doesn't seem to have affected uh, luxury watch making. Maybe it has affected you know, prices around the 200, 300, 400, or even below uh, 100. But uh, I would say that uh, the, 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 prestige is, uh, the prestige watch market is in very good shape. And I also would say that the future is to have a good mechanical watch on one wrist and uh, an iPhone terminal on the other wrist because wrists are a privileged 
area of our body that we can access uh, easily. And um, I would say that the future is that. And I will uh, always remember what uh, Frank Muller told me at the end of the 90s. Uh, he would say that the future uh, is the combination of mechanical watchmaking and uh, an electronic device. And uh, use, by using a me uh, prestigious and stylish mechanical uh, watch on one wrist and a, a connected watch on the other wrist, I would say we're, uh, we, can, we could cover uh, both areas and, uh, and make the most out of our own uh, uh, smartphone by using a, a connected watch. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which is the most uh, relevant innovation happened uh, in the luxury water industry over the last years or a uh, period of time the last, uh, the last years? Oh, whew. Uh, there is a, a wide subject. I would say that uh, I would go a little bit further back uh, to the 90s. Of course, in the 90s, we we saw the resurrection of mechanical watchmaking after the quartz crisis. But in the 90s, uh, we saw also the advent of the internet and the internet, the democratized uh, information. We started having uh, those uh, watch portals like time zone. And then uh, suddenly information via the internet was accessible to a wide range of people. And uh, aficionados became more and more educated. So that was a, a, a huge revolution, an innovation that was a huge uh, revolution. And of course, also in that line, social media also helped uh, uh, take uh, high hands uh, watch brands even further, because of course, everybody knows uh, Rolex or Tag Heuer or Breitling. And then people became uh, accustomed to brands such as Audemars Piguet and Richard Mille and Patek Philippe. So that was a huge uh, difference between uh, the, the, the modern times and, uh, and the past, the, the advent of internet. Uh, and then we have uh, also the, the big luxury conglomerates buying brands. So that was also a big change. Brands were not independent uh, anymore, even though we still have independent brands and manufacturers, such as uh, Patek Philippe, for instance. But uh, the, the, the advent of luxury conglomerates, the Swatch Group, uh, the Richemont, LVMH, also was a big change uh, between now uh, and the past. And of course, the, the manufactured craze, because the tradition of uh, mechanical watchmaking in Switzerland is, uh, is the dem democratic system uh, of suppliers and clients and uh, manufacture of movements, manufacture of dials, manufacture of cases, and of course uh, the the, man uh, the the manufacture idea, the in-house production was not only necessary but also it was a, a marketing tool. And the fashionista started, you know, wanting to buy a, a watch that would be in-house. Whereas the tradition of the Swiss watchmaking is not in house. Patek Philippe would use Gégel Couture movements. Vacheron, uh, Constantin would use uh, uh, manufacture movements. Even Old Marpigay. We're talking about the, the, the Holy Trinity. So the, the biggest brands, brands were not uh, man, complete manufacturers. So that was also uh, a big change. And of course, in the past years, it's the 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 the, the the weight of the pre-owned markets, which is now worth several billion, as I as I mentioned, and we have the recent uh, news of uh, Rolex uh, controlling its own pre-owned timepieces with a, with a new certification. Very interesting. Um, and how much in that that scenario uh, in the in the luxury uh, watches industry is uh, sensitive on on trends and maybe there is an opportunity for niche brands or or uh, independent brands uh, in, the, in the luxury uh, um, watches industry well uh, one of the recent trends is also the advent of micro brands micro brands uh, they have uh, a limited production they can be more flexible in regards to uh, to uh, bigger companies that have to to answer to act, uh, to uh, actionists and uh, to the administration boards 
so the, the advent of uh, micro brands were also, was very important for watch aficionados because you, you could have time pieces that are not uh, expensive, but that can be quite original. Brands such as Isotop, which is a, uh, a brand founded by a Portuguese, a brand uh, such as uh, uh, Studio uh, Underdog, also Full and Mari. So that was also a big, uh, a big difference between um, recent times and the past. The advent of micro brands and uh, the luxury watch industry being uh, sensitive to trends. I think the, the the luxury watch industry has to be sensitive to uh, general trends such as. Um, uh, the rehabilitation of materials, the, the uh, renewable materials, circular economy, and uh, the luxury watch industry is really following that trend, paying a lot of attention to that trend. There have been forums and panels, discussion panels uh, recently, uh, talking about, the, about, about the, those issues, the renewables and circular economy. So they are sensitive to that. Then, of course, we have the you know the usual trends, the the, the colors and the, the complications, and the, most of them follow the the same trend. But uh, overall, we have uh, a big variety within within the industry. Right, and Mr. Shabra, in that scenario, it's uh, it is a good idea to invest in uh, luxury watches. Well, the first thing I want to say is. Watches are not investments and should not be treated or seen as such. This is the first thing. Investments are other things. Uh, the one things that we learned from the books, economic books and so on, real estate, stocks and so on. But watches can perform as assets, returning good investments. So it's different. Um, for me, it is wise to invest on the things that you truly know and appreciate. I used to say that anyone can make money with what he knows the best. Uh, some people can make money with wine, I can't. Uh, some people can do it with art or old guitars. And uh, many folks can do it with watches as long as they know what they are doing. So one of the golden rules of investing is to diversify and always be prepared to lose the invested money. So you got to forget that money. So you should treat watches as you would treat other assets. So yes, I think it is a very good idea to invest in luxury watch, uh, watches, but as long as you know what you are doing and as long as you know all the risks uh, involved. And also right. if you have access to the to the right time pieces, which is oh, yeah. uh, not an easy thing to do. Harder and harder, yeah. So it's uh, at the moment it's difficult to access to that, that uh, very specific uh, pieces. Well, not particularly difficult. Uh, it's tricky. Uh, you need to study the market. You need to do your homework, but there are plenty of watches that you can return your invest in one, two years. Easy. Uh, but you need to know what you are doing. It mm -hmm. could be a flop, so you need to really know and understand. Uh -huh. And how profitable uh, might be if we invest uh, wisely from a short term, medium and, and long term perspective? OK, so le let's consider, for example, this ideal scenario. Um, you invested on highly sought after pieces, uh, some limited editions or some very rare vintage finds. So on the short term, short term returns, let's say up to two years. For these pieces, you can get 10 to 30 percent on a conservative scenario on return. You can get 30 to 50 percent on a hot piece a uh, piece that is also fueled by some market speculation and so on. And then on the medium term, in terms of returns, let's say up to five years, I would say you can double uh, the invested value with these on these particular hot pieces. On the long term, 10 to 20 years, uh, I mean, the sky's the limit. Uh, there's no limit for the returns you can get. For example, it is a fact uh, that Rolex watches, they have been outperforming the Standard & Poor's 500 for the last 60 years. This is a fact. It has been studied. So there are countless stories of all those folks that back in the 60s and 70s, they bought their watch, their only watch for $150, for example. And now they are selling or, or those watches are hitting the, um, all the bidding in all the auction houses for 30 40, 50K, 
because they kept it all original with box and papers and so on. Of course, in this case, you got to adjust the prices to the currency infla inflation and so on. But even, even so, uh, you can see the sky's the limit for the, the money they invested. It was probably a one month salary back in the 60s and they can probably now buy a car with it. So hmm. really, the, the sky's the limit, for example. But closer to, to our date, uh, 10 years ago, you could buy Rolex steel uh, sports model, let's say a 40 millimeters for three or four K. Nowadays, you will struggle to find a basic one uh, for less than 10 K or back in 2006, uh, a real example, a clear example, a new Submariner would cost you new at the store 3.5 K in 2006. Uh, nowadays, that same Submariner will cost you in the used market 10 to 12 K even if that Submariner has been heavily used. So, and the same happens, for example, with the Daytonas. Uh, but the only difference here, uh, difference is the fact that the full steel Daytona cannot be bought for under 22 or 25K used without box and paper some, so. <laughs> okay, uh, you, you mentioned before the term risk. Uh, could you identify the main risk of uh... Uh, luxury watch, watches investment? Well, I believe there are no risk-free investments, okay? Uh, real estate, you can buy a house or or, or something that, that is impacted by an earthquake area or you, you, your house can 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 burn down, down to the ground or your, your money can go down the pipe if the bank goes bankrupt. So all the investments have risks. Um, even art can be stolen or forged. And I believe the same happens with watches. Uh, the main risks are, of course, wearing them can be dangerous. Uh, and we have been witnessing some really violent crimes in some major cities, such as uh, London, for example, some cities in Italy. And for example, in Spain, Barcelona has been a very complicated place to wear a good watch. Um, having them stored in the bank or at home can also be dangerous as well. Um, you can also suffer from other risks. You can also suffer from market speculation, for example, market corrections and market bubbles. Uh, so buy wisely and learn how to store your watches. That's my take. <laughs> okay. So it's crucial to have the, the support of a, a professional specializing in luxury for an oh, advisor yeah. like you. Oh, it's, yeah, totally. Uh, absolutely important. And which brands and models do you recommend the most at the moment? In terms okay. of investment, of course. Sure. Uh, in terms of investing, and uh, my vote uh, just takes into account the watch versus investment return or investment re reliability. It has nothing to do with passion, but my vote goes to, in the first place, uh, Patek Philippe, in the second, uh, Langunzone, third place, Rolex, and fourth, some vintage Cartiers. Uh, but maybe Miguel has, has a, a different view on this. Yeah, I would say uh, I would add a few ones because we've seen that uh, it's getting harder and harder to get uh, Patek Philippe's, uh, to get uh, Rolexes, Royal Oaks from from Audemars Piguet. So um, the latest trend in the auction market and even between aficionados is to go uh, towards uh, independence. I'm talking about uh, Acrivia and Rexepi, uh, the founder of Acrivia. The Batoon, which is a brand that I especially appreciate, an incredible brand like producing watches like no other. Uh, also, um, Kari Vutilainen. Vutilainen produces incredible timepieces. First price, 80,000. And he has sold out his production until 2028. Uh, and I've been saying this because I was with him the, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he, he also won nine prizes at the Grand Prix d'Orlogie de Genève, uh, and he's not even Swiss. He's a, he's a Finnish uh, watchmaker that came to Swiss when he was uh, Switzerland when he was young. So his his watches are really sought after. So uh, those independent uh, watches, uh, watchmakers, and, and and brands are really sought after, and uh, uh, their value is growing up. Uh, etc. in auctions and of course uh, Richard Mille. I mean, I also uh, write and, and, and commentate uh, for your sport uh, about tennis and uh, Rafael Nadal, a, a Spanish champion mm -hmm. that you you yeah. you know really well because you're from mm -hmm. his country. Uh, his his watches. I mean, each edition of a uh, Richard Mille Rafael Nadal 
uh, tourbillon as 50 units. So uh, the latest, the latest edition, each unit was selling for a thousand, oh, a million, a million euros, right? And you can only find those watches in auctions, and the price is above two, two million. So that's incredible. That, incredible. That, that really is incredible. And of course, then, then you have uh, uh, also micro brands producing cheaper watches, but the the, the limited run is so is so small that mm -hmm. if you think the watch is cool, you're you're trying to find out uh, in the pre-owned market, and you're uh, eager to pay more than what it, it really costs. So you have several examples, but uh, but Juan really provided a few good ones. I added a, a few others, so I think we have no, covered thank everything. You, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, what's the roadmap do you recommend to follow up as a uh, uh, new uh, investor in a uh, luxury uh, watch industry? Okay, so I think everyone should build their own path, uh, their own way. Uh, I mean, start small, learn your way, read, fail, keep trying. It's, it's, it's like this for everything, right? Uh, I think we all started back there with Seiko's and Timex's. Uh, this is one of the possible path if you have the time and will to do it so. Uh, and then one watch leads to the other one and to the next one, and that's how it's done. It's one of the possible ways. But if you don't have the time or the will to do that, I believe you can trust the professional. Um, and the best advice I can give you or I can give to anyone on this is buy the seller and not the watch. Um, try to understand, try to review the watch charts, all the graphs that are available in the internet. Try to understand the market. Try to understand Chrono24, which is a great website as a backup, as a tool, uh, knowing its flaws, but as a basic guideline for pricing. Yeah. I mean, uh, these days, Chrono24, and then you have uh, similar companies growing in stature, and uh, that have become uh, huge uh, players in the market, such as Watchbox and Watchfinder. And you have uh, the luxury groups also investing in those in those um, companies to you know to to help uh, um, secure their pre-owned match uh, pre-owned watches so that's uh, i think i think um, chrono 24 is a great example uh, but also um, you, you need education and information and uh, understand the, the provenance and also if the, the watch has a good narrative also also adds so I think information and education is key. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, which are the most uh, reliable platforms or channels to buy? Well, I think long are gone those garage sale days. Uh, okay, those Daytona selling for a thousand euros are long gone. Uh, it's it's done. It's over. But I believe there's, that there are still good deals that can be found at private parties. Uh, but I, I would say to avoid this, uh, this is my advice, it's very risky to buy at private parties. Um, so I think the best channels right now, as Miguel was referring to those 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 websites, uh, I'm just sticking here with Chrono24, it's the one I have the most experience with. I would say look at Chrono24 and try to understand professional sellers around your zone, your your where you live. Go visit them uh, and try to understand how they treat the watches and how they treat the business in general. Uh, pay a visit, go there, try to, to, to feel by yourself, see the watches in your hand. Um, if you feel safe on buying abroad, uh, use Chrono24, because this, this kind of platform, or at least this one, uh, ensures that the business is done and it protects the buyer much more than it protects the seller. So. Prices on uh, Chrono24 are usually inflated by eight to ten percent because it's that their margin, uh, that it's it's their margin for facilitate and ensure the business. Uh, but at least the seller will only get your money after you have received your watch, so you are protected. There are insurance for the business for for that particular deal. So uh, I think that's a good channel to to buy. Yeah, these days those those companies they provide some sort of insurance so we can buy. Uh, with with some with some trust, whereas in the past, you know, you could have uh, bad experiences, lose money, and get scammed. So it's it's always um, important to to follow those those channels that provide you some sort of uh, insurance. 
but yeah, but long gone are the barn finds. I don't think uh, these days, with all the information available, I don't think these days you can find one of those uh, barn finds, uh, Patek Philippe for a, for a bargain. It's 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 really difficult. And what's uh, your perspective about uh, uh, the second-hand uh, luxury watches? Well, I, I believe watches uh, outperform our human life. So I think watches will keep beating after we are dead. This is a fact as well. I mean, age is no concern for a watch. Uh, and second-hand watches are part of the business. It's part of the business equation. So I think, again, you should buy the seller, try to... to bond with the seller um, and one can get formidable deals on second-hand watches uh, such as watches that are 30 to 40 percent cheaper compared to that same watch that is still on sale new on the on the window store again i'm not mentioning or i'm not referring to those hot models and hot brands that i'm talking that, that we already talked about rolex and so on this doesn't happen but in general terms for other brands let's say uh, oyer or other brands, JLC and so on. You can get a, a one-year-old or two-year-old watch that is still up for sale, and you can get it for much cheaper in the used market. Um, so, but in general, a watch, and again, not referring or not comparing to those highly sought-after pieces, usually behave as a new car does. So, as soon as you take it out of the car stand, it has already lost a significant parcel of its of its value. It's, it's normal; it needs to be like that. Yeah, agree. And uh, it's, uh, is there any way to find out interesting watches which are not still on the market in order to take advantage of that? Okay, so I think that's the one million dollar question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think everyone is looking for the next big thing. Uh, and to understand this, I think one needs to be very experienced and to know the, the market very well. Um, as said before, and, and Miguel already uh, said it, so uh, those great garage deals and, and bargain pateks are gone. Uh, but th there are still money uh, to be made. Uh, in my very personal opinion, for example, this is just my opinion, I think it, it is a good time to invest on vintage uh, Brighton Navi timers. Uh, and this is just my gut feeling uh, from what I've been witnessing for the last 20 years. For example, a few years ago, you could buy a vintage Speedmaster. And I say a few years ago, like five, six, seven years ago, um, you could buy um, a Speedmaster for... 1500 or 2000 euros, not anymore. Now you can expect for that same vintage watch to pay seven up to 10K. So, and I see the same uh, happening with vintage Navi timers. They are still around three to 4K. And there are very interesting um, editions from the 80s and, and, and the 90s, and even older cosmographs from the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. uh, the 24 hour layout uh, dial. They can still be found for three and four K, and I believe these have a huge potential to explode in value uh, for the next five to seven years. The same goes, in my opinion, with some vintage Oyer Carrera chronographs. I think they have already started to yeah. to explode, the Altavias and so on. But there are still some business to be made, and I also believe that the eighties will be the next time frame uh, to explode in value. Uh, even some quartz uh, watches. We can already see that on some vintage Cartiers from the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see the Oyster quartz from Rolex already starting to increase in value, but still not there. I think that's a good catch as well. Um, we can see, for example, loads of re-editions. Even now Tissot is just doing a, a reissue of the PRX um, on, on their design from the 70s and 80s. So I think that's a, a good generation to look into the next bargains or the next great deals. Yeah. Miguel, maybe maybe you have any any <laughs> other opinion? Even though the 80s were the worst decade in watch exactly. design, as I, the, 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 be, the worst taste in, in watchmaking, you can find it in, in the 80s. But, uh, but yeah, there are a few uh, 80s uh, icons, such as the Panther from Cartier. Cartier is a, is a brand that is a, it's a brand that knows, it's a brand that understands luxury. And usually, French brands they really do understand uh, luxury, from Louis Vuitton to to Hermes to to Cartier. So they're always a secure bet. 
and uh, Cartier, I think the Cartier will raise uh, you know awareness and uh, and value in the in the pre-owned markets. And uh, of course, uh, you mentioned uh, the Navy Timer. I agree completely. Uh, Navy Timer is an icon of, of watchmaking, and um, they had a significant anniversary this year. So they, I think, relaunched uh, the Navy Timer, a new generation of the Navy Timer, and of course, that adds value to the original Navy Timers and the vintage the Navy Timers. You also mentioned uh, uh, Hoyer. I'm a huge aficionado of, um, of uh, vintage Hoyer and the chronograph from the 70s. I'm actually wearing a Monaco and a fix of flex bracelet. And I went to the first ever Hoyer only auction uh, that took place in, in London in 2010. And from then on, prices uh, are going up regularly. And the, the, the original Monaco's and the original Otavias and the original Carreras are are really cool timepieces, and um, it's it's also a good bet. Uh, let me add that personally, of course, João is is uh, he has a different view, but I personally made the choice to not go the vintage way because that would uh, um, that would demand also funding for uh, for uh, servicing and uh, uh, some some concerns that uh, I I was not willing to to take so uh, I most of my timepieces are, are contemporary and some of them are of course re-edition of iconic timepieces well right. said I'm mostly I'm mostly a vintage man uh, I prefer the vintage timepieces but that's what it is I mean it's like classic cars or new cars it's the same exactly. thing exactly exactly great I have already mentioned many brands, many, many specific uh, models, pieces. And what would be your first, uh, your first priority at the moment, if you, not depending on the budget, if you uh, would like to, to invest in one specific uh, uh, piece, what would be your first priority at, at the moment? Miguel, you want to go first? Oh. It's like I mean, uh, working. It's difficult, I know. <laughs> working in the watch industry and being a watch journalist, there are a thousand models that I could think of, and a uh, hundred that come to mind immediately. I uh, the other day I had uh, lunch in Madrid with a with a with a friend from Langenzone who was wearing the 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 newest generation of the Zeitwerk, and the Zeitwerk is a fabulous timepiece. I I love Lange. Because I've been going to uh, Glashut and Dresden since the late 90s, when everything was still uh, uh, too much Eastern Germany, you could see, you could feel the weight of 40 years of communism. It was really a closed city, and in 20 years, the city changed completely and became the capital of arts and the Baroque that used to be. And uh, and and uh, Langenzona's um, history. Is for me the most phenomenal uh, history in watchmaking, alongside uh, the the Zenit one, and uh, it's it's a brand that I hold dear, not only because of its ethics, but also because of its quality, integrity, and uh, the longer one, the datograph, and the Zeitwerk. And the Zeitwerk is a very special timepiece because uh, it's it's a digital timepiece. Uh, um, really innovative at the time. It was the first one to have uh, digital jumping hours and, and minutes uh, because there's always a problem with the, the providing the power necessary to 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 make the the, the watch jump for 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 a long duration and uh, the Zeitwerk is a fabulous time piece I would I would go for a Zeitwerk but uh, the, the the first price for a Zeitwerk I think it's around 70,000 so the Zeitwerk would be one for the independent independent watch making I would love to have uh, um, a debutune, almost any debutune, because debutune does things that no one else does, and uh, they're a master watchmaker, Denis Flageolet. It's a, he, he's a genius. Also, François Paul I would I, I'm, I'm, I would always tend towards the, the independents, not only because I know all of them, they're they're, they're friends of mine. François Paul Max Boozer from MBNF, Kari Vutilainen, and the Grenfell brothers. And also uh, Danny Flageolet and Pierre Jacques at the Batuna. Uh, I, I would go 
I would go to a, to an independent watch brand, but of course you can find good timepieces almost every every brand. As I told you, I'm I'm a lover of the the, the Oyer chronographs from the 70s and the reeditions. So there's there's a huge uh, landscape to choose from. There's a huge universe, and when people start in watchmaking, you know they know those brands, the the Rolexes and the the Tag Heuers and the Breitlings, and then when they dive on this universe they understand that the, the, there are so many brands that are even higher hands and better with better finishing with better technique with better complication than the the, the brands that everybody knows so it's a fascinating world and there is a lot to choose from my answer would be a bit more mainstream in this case <laughs> compared to yours miguel <laughs> i would say if i could just invest in one watch or one brand right now or if someone just has some money and wants to invest lightly on on a brand, I would choose Rolex. I think it's a very safe bet. It it's is. very hard to make mistakes uh, investing in Rolex. Uh, and I usually say that if I if I was told you can only pick one watch for the rest of your life, or if you go to a desert yeah. islands, you can only pick one watch. I would say okay. I would uh, because I'm a chrono guy. I would choose the Rolex Daytona. So I, I I I agree with you, but that would be if I only had one one pick one choice. But uh, but if I had the funds and uh, to buy any kind of watch, uh, I would go to to the independent eye hand of the watchmakers. Yeah. yeah, we we all I believe we all play that game that only uh, watch uh, <laughs> if I could. Um, yeah. I would say if I would only have one watch, it would be probably a Rolex Explorer thirty six millimeters, perfect watch. Uh, Great size, one size fits all. Yeah, all that's, occasions. That's the only Rolex that I have, the Explorer, but 39 millimeter. Okay. Uh, and uh, of course, I love uh, the Chrono Perpetuals from Patek. To me, it's the the, yeah. the Patek Philippe Essence, not the Nautilus. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know the 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 recent craze regarding integrated design. You know the all the 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 Royal Oak and the Nautilus. And I think the Royal Oak, I, I prefer by far the Royal Oak to the Nautilus. It helps yeah. all other brands that also have integrated designs in their collections and also other brands that just started new designs with an integrated uh, timepiece. So the Laureate from Gerard Perigo is um, be benefits from, from, the, the, from the craze around the Royal Oak and the, the, uh, and the Nautilus. Uh, Vachon Constantin also reissued my favorite integrated design from the, the, the 70s, which was the 222. It was one of the watches of the year for me, and uh, it was recently elected uh, at the Watch of the Year event that I'm a member of uh, the jury of uh, in, in Warsaw. So uh, it's interesting to, to see the, the, um, the integrated design craze. And it's also a good bet. If you want to buy a watch, go and buy an integrated design timepiece because it, because it will grow in value. And um, and, and uh, João mentioned the, the Tissot a PRX, which is a, a watch that costs a few hundred uh, euros, like 600, 700. They, they also launched the chronograph. But it's a, it's a, it's a great timepiece uh, for a great price. So integrated design timepieces are also a good bet these days. Fantastic, great. Uh, uh, Mr. Miguel Sabra, Mr. Joao Vilariño, it has been a great, great pleasure to have had you in VIP Today TV, uh, particularly in the present situation where the uh, Portuguese national team is playing now. Uh, thank you very much again for your time, for sharing uh, with uh, our audience uh, your deep knowledge about the uh, luxury watches industry. And hopefully we can we can uh, see you face to face in, in over the next uh, months and time. So thanks again, and friends of luxury, friends of VIP today. See you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks.